So what I'm going to talk about uh, is after some uh, brief background on the Wallace Foundation, um, one of the explain some of the reasons why we came to audience building as a focus for our uh, initiatives in the arts, and then spend the bulk of my time on the lessons from the Road to Results that Laura mentioned, um, and then a little bit about how market research can look costly when viewed only as an expense, but looks a little different when you think of it as an investment that has a return on it if it's used effectively and um, connected to action. And then I want to try to leave some time for your questions. So the mission of the Wallace Foundation reflects the interests of the folks who made the money, um, DeWitt Wallace and Lila Atchison Wallace. Uh, they had many philanthropic interests, but at, uh, core to DeWitt Wallace's interest was youth development and to Lila was the arts. So our foundation today has a mission of, of improving learning and enrichment for the least advantaged children in the United States and the vitality of the arts for everyone. In the arts area, we came to building audiences by uh, focusing on the audience of arts organizations. We did a um, market research study in 2014 of 400 arts organization leaders and they identified out of a list of 27 possibilities their top 10 challenges and it struck us that these grouped naturally into a couple of uh, topic or themes. Uh, the biggest ones were fundraising and building audiences. That doesn't surprise anyone because they're connected to revenues, right? Earned and contributed revenues and they're closely intertwined. Of course, as we're all aware, participation rates in the United States in um, the arts have been declining, at least as defined by the National Endowment for the Arts in their uh, survey every four years. Uh, since um, 1992, the percentage of the population attending what the NEA defines as a benchmark arts has declined from 41% to 33% in uh, 2012. So um, with that in mind, we uh, uh, looked into our own experience, the work of our grantees, to see what we could uh, tease out that would be helpful to the field and that could guide our work going forward. The Wallace Excellence Awards were a series of grants made between 2006 and 2014 a period, you, I should note, that included the financial crisis and the Great Recession, so keep that in mind when we think about the uh, results here. We funded 54 organizations to do research on audiences that they identified as wishing to attract in order to understand the specific barriers that were preventing them from coming and to then design interventions or programs or experiments that would overcome those barriers and and cause those people to, to come to their organizations. Uh, a requirement of uh, some of these grants was that they collect data on the audiences and whether or not these uh, efforts worked. There were 46 arts groups for which we were able to get reliable data. And interestingly, among those, um, what we found in spite of the environment that the median size gain in audience of those who were trying to grow their overall audience was 27 percent in the middle of the uh, financial crisis. Uh, for those looking at a particular target audience, it was 61 percent average growth, but that's, a, that's from a low base. Usually if you're targeting people who aren't coming, you have a fairly low number, but still a 60 percent increase is uh, a pretty spectacular. From all of that, we were able to develop a number of tools that we hope are of use to the field, 10 specific case studies. I'll be drawing from three of those or four of those in a minute. And then two broader reports, the Road to Results, which um, looks at nine common themes from the uh, most successful of these organizations, and um, a guide to working, a practical guide to using market research called Taking Out the Guesswork. These and all of our materials are available for free on our website um, if you, and, and, and on your table. But. <laughs> so from the work of these um, 46 organizations and the 10 in-depth case studies in particular, there were five general principles that we, we distilled. The first is that audiences are actually open to being engaged in new ways. 
Um, in spite of the dis declining participation across the uh, disciplines in total, there is a hunger out there for new experiences and, and being challenged. And, but there are no silver bullets. There's no one way to do it that works in every context. It's a long game. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, the, it, it really helps if the entire organization is aligned behind the effort. If it's just a uh, effort of the marketing organization and the artistic side thinks it's actually just going to taint what they do, that's not going to work. Um, it, it, everybody has to um, uh, be aligned around the same goals. It's very helpful to use data market research to understand exactly what the barriers are rather than guess. Um, and, and that's a point I'll return to later. And if it doesn't serve the mission of the organization, it's not going to be authentic and it's ultimately not going to work. Because people come to great arts organizations because of the great art and, the great, uh, and, and their missions, not in spite of it. So those were um, general things. We also looked, though, at the practical level at how do you um, uh, do this. And that's what led to the identification of nine effective practices that um, Bob Harlow, a, a researcher, uh, distilled from the work of the, these 10 in-depth case studies. Uh, they group into two broad themes. Uh, one is creating um, meaningful connections with the audience, uh, which is the outward-facing element we heard about just a minute ago from Timothy. But they also, there's a group that talks about this organizational alignment piece um, being uh, having the organization ready and, and able to support those goals. I can't cover all nine of these today, so I'm going to focus on three of them. Um, identifying target audiences, the use of market research, and organizational alignment. Of course, um, you can learn a lot more about all of them in the reports on your desk and the case studies. So let me start with identifying audiences, and I'm going to use here one of our case studies from the Steppenwolf Theater Company in uh, Chicago. And if anybody didn't see um, August Osage County, you missed a great production. Um, the issue in front of Steppenwolf that they were tackling was the decline of subscription sales. Uh, across all regional theaters, there was a 14 percent drop from 2005 to 2009. This is a problem in part because single ticket buyers have a lower margin in business terms. They cost more to get every dollar of revenue, about 23 cents compared to 13 cents for a subscription ticket uh, by some studies. So the question in front of them was, how do we deepen engagement with both subscribers and single ticket buyers um, to keep the uh, renewal rate on subscribers up and to turn single ticket buyers, at least behaviorally, into multiple purchasers, more like um, uh, subscription people. They did a number of focus groups with their um, both su subscribers and single ticket buyers and were surprised uh, by the, the first finding here and that is um, across uh, the, the board a, a pretty good swath of their single ticket buyers were as adamant a Steppenwolf fan as their subscribers were. So uh, connection and uh, engagement wasn't the barrier which the, the, I think was one of their starting assumptions. Um, and uh, across both groups, they all considered themselves to be lifelong learners who wanted to be challenged and intellectually engaged by the, by the theater. So that gave them some clues as to um, a strategy going forward. They called their strategy the public square, by which they really meant using the theater as a place to where ideas could be revealed, explored, and where people could be challenged and grow in, as, as a collective social experience. The way they implemented that was at every single performance, every night, they have a post-show um, discussion, which focuses not on the technique, the sort of the costumes, the makeup, the lighting, uh, but on the themes in the play and how those themes uh, are the, the reactions of the audience to that in their own lives and their own thinking. And so one of the things they did is they didn't have the actors lead these discussions, uh, which is the more normal pattern. They had the critics and people, the dramaturges from their, uh, their organization come out and talk about the, the themes and the, and the content and the art itself. 
They also retooled their website to um, have a lot more content on um, the, the uh, themes in the play and how audiences re re uh, reacted to them. The, uh, they understood that socializing was an important part of what these audiences wanted, so they, they created these as free um, social events. And importantly, they did not make this a uh, privilege of membership. So it wasn't open only to subscribers because they had discovered that single ticket buyers had just as much of an affiliation. They were trying to grow the sense of affiliation so it was open equally to everybody. Um, they found that they could get 13 to 15 percent of the audience to stay um, after each show to have these discussions and in a time where online websites were growing uh, at regional theaters and, and interactions with them, downloads and visits, at about 6 percent, their growth was 11 percent. Um, they were successful in getting the non-subscribers to buy uh, tickets to uh, subsequent shows at a 61 percent higher rate than they had before. So that was a, um, they considered that a good outcome. They also uh, found that their subscription renewal rate was 80%, which is seven percentage points higher than the national average. So it had a beneficial effect on both sides. Now, one of the things that often inhibits organizations from aligning across the entire organization behind an effort like this is a fear on the artistic side that this means somehow we're dumbing down or we're going to have the audience tell us what to put on and it'll be the nutcracker every single time, right? Um, the, um, that did not happen here. The, what the artistic side of this house found was engaging in authentic, deep conversation with the audience was a meaningful experience for the artists. And uh, this is the artistic director of Steppenwolf saying, it was incredibly moving to hear the audience members talk about their own histories and the way the play impacted them per personally. So it was a mission enhancing effort. So the takeaway was the organization started off worrying about subscriptions going down, found that it w that wasn't really the issue. It was how do you build um, a deeper relationship with both single ticket <coughs> buyers and subscribers, and they found ways to do it, and it showed up in the data. <laughs> so now talking about market research, I'm going to use the example of the Pacific Northwest Ballet in Seattle. They were keenly aware of those NEA statistics and the drop of 35 percent uh, since 1982 in per capita ballet attendance. And their new um, director, Peter Bull, who arrived in 20, 2005, said, not only for Pacific Northwest Ballet, but for ballet as a discipline, I want to focus on teenagers and get them connected to the ballet. Um, their efforts in this area, however, had been um, underwhelming. The, um, they had done it mostly around price. The assumption was the b main barrier to coming was the cost of the tickets, so they offered deep discounts, but they actually didn't get that many. They got some, but not the level of teenage engagement that they were hoping for. So they did a survey, and price was a practical barrier, but there were a few perceptual barriers too, like it's boring. <laughs> Uh, all ballets are the same. It's too stuffy and formal. And uh, that was kind of a wake-up call to some of the, the folks who did not view ballet this way. Um, they then, having seen this at the survey level, said, well, what's beneath that? And they held focus groups. And they came up with some uh, better understandings, such as in the young adult space, I hesitate to go to something like that because I feel I might get in there and then go, Wow, I feel like an idiot. I don't know any of these French terms for these various poses, so I, you know, I, I'll feel inadequate. Um, or it seems like a very formal evening, something you maybe wouldn't do with a large group of friends. Uh, this is a common pattern across research of younger age groups. They do things in packs. Um, and um, so I, I often observe this with my daughters, you know, my wife and I, aren't going to go out on a Thursday night unless we know we'll get into the restaurant at 6.30 and we know we have tickets. They will happily go stand in line for two hours at a club and not even get in because standing in line is the social experience. <laughs> and that's okay. Um, so it's just different preferences and you can't get into the, you can't connect with audiences if you 
to do it out of your own uh, assumptions. You have to get under theirs. Or my favorite from a teenager, it's like sitting with someone else's parents. <laughs> so um, uh, Peter Boll, um, who was worried about um, a proposed rebranding effort as being nothing but sort of slick marketing, got his mind completely changed about this by sitting on the backside of that one-way mirror and watching a couple of focus groups with teenagers and actually listening to them uh, make remarks like that. So he, he got um, uh, very into it and began meeting regularly with teenagers himself, which is, this is a photo of one of those meetings. And they, the Pacific Northwest ba Ballet created um, a couple of things that responded directly to that desire for socialization, socializing opportunities, and um, the specialness of the uh, event and the experience. They decided that whenever they premiered a new work of dance, they do the very first performance in a teen-only free event. So it became a special thing for them. And they um, would also, uh, dealing with that perception of not belonging, they actually put in the program an ad to the regular ballet folks saying, if there's a teenager next to you, say hi, be nice, make them feel welcome. <laughs> um, and uh, they worked with the ushers to say, look, if you see a teenager, reach out. Um, it was a, a holistic approach to it. The rebranding was also important. If you look at their website page uh, before, what you see for Romeo and Juliet is an emphasis on the art form, the, the technique. What the research told them uh, younger people uh, wanted, especially because they didn't want to look like they didn't know what they were doing, is intimacy, emotion, and a kind of connection. So they rebranded around um, images of the, that con connoted the emotional content of the mm -hmm. ballet as opposed to the great um, uh, technique. Uh, in fact, uh, on a brochure, one of the um, teenagers reacted to the old brochure of, that's a really weird pose, it looks like the dancer's in pain. <laughs> um, so it w just wasn't connecting. Um, so the results, this is something, uh, Seattle has a, uh, something called Teen Ticks, where uh, on the day of a performance across a wide variety of performing arts organizations, a teenager can get a really deeply discounted ticket. Um, ballet wasn't selling well on that platform uh, at, at the, in 2008-9 when they beginning and they more than doubled the sales through that particular um, uh, channel. Um, and Im more importantly to them, the number of teenagers they, and young people they got coming back to performances rose from about 500 up to the 800 level and stayed there. So they thought that was a, a good outcome. So let me turn to uh, organizational alignment and here use a local example, the Fleischer Art Memorial. I do this with some hesitation. You all know a lot more about it than I do. So if I don't quite state something right and the folks from Fleischer are in the audience. So I apologize in advance if I say anything not quite right. But uh, th this organization you know, was founded in the late 19th century as a way to bring arts education to the immigrant population in the Southeast Philadelphia uh, area. And its mission today is to make art accessible to everyone regardless of economic means, background, or artistic experience. But the area has changed. It's still an area of, of lots of immigrants, but they're not from Europe anymore. They're from uh, Latin America, and China, and Southeast Asia. Um, the, the, they noticed a pattern that um, only 21% of the visitors to Fleischer at, at the building for their programs uh, came from nearby neighborhoods. Their offsite programs out in the neighborhoods, which were much more successful at engaging the uh, folks from that neighborhood. Um, so they did research on these two zip codes here in Philadelphia and found that there were a number of barriers to the residents participating at Fleischer. Um, there was limited awareness that Fleischer existed. It looks like a church. They didn't understand it was an art school. Um, there were a, an assumption, well, I can't afford it. Um, there, uh, there, at the time this was done, all of the programming, all of the marketing material was in English. And people who either didn't speak it or had limited English um, uh, capabilities, basically all that added up to a sense that's not for me. Um, so the strategy that was developed was to um, 
outreach, uh, to do a lot of outreach to the specific targeted communities, showing up at their community festivals and other public events, advertising in the neighborhood press and in the non-English language um, newspapers, uh, making demonstrations of the art uh, uh, available and simplifying the course catalogs. Um, an important thing here, the, they learned that um, the residents of this neighborhood did not work a traditional uh, work schedule. So in order to have the classes available at times when they could take it, they needed to change the course schedule. Um, they also did a lot of work internally uh, uh, around training the very first folks who come, who have an encounter with the visitors at the front desk, uh, around being welcoming and um, how to engage with people from different backgrounds. Uh, did a number of community engagement workshops, um, baked it into their onboarding and recruiting processes for new hires. It was not without its internal challenges. They had to engage directly and straightforwardly with staff who were worried about, is this going to um, affect the quality of our offering? Are we going to drive out the people who are here now by bringing a new set of folks in? Um, and importantly, they did a structural change. It, it used to be that those off-site programs out in the neighborhood were run by one division of the organization and the on-site by another one. And since that was a source of some of the um, silo problems of communication between, they merged them into a single uh, department. Um, they, these are survey results from a, a question, in your opinion, how much does Fleischer care about serving the following groups? And what you can see is that between 2009 and 2012, they made some real headway on perceptions of caring about South Philly residents, people who don't speak English well, people getting just, just getting started in the art, and people of non-US cultural heritage. And those perceptions are really important things to change as a precursor to being able to increase engagement. Um, there, there was an increase in the enrollment from the targeted neighborhood um, from, from around 790 to a little over 1,100. Um, not as much of a demographic shift uh, in this time frame as I think was hoped for, but that goes back to it's a long game. You've got to stick with it for a long time. It takes uh, more than just five years or four years to change perceptions at, at that fundamental level. So to illustrate the um, issue of re the return on investment that is possible from the skillful use of market research, I want to uh, use another Philadelphia example from the Clay Studio. Um, they had become concerned that the core audience of college educated professionals uh, and retirees was aging and they weren't getting very many newcomers in. So there was a worry about the sustainability of the organization. And that one, they wanted to focus on the growing number of young professionals who uh, work in the old city arts district. Uh, and after a number of failed experiences, experiments, they found success in something called date night on a Friday, um, which where novices could come have a hands-on experience with ceramics in this informal environment. And they decided to conduct more research. Um, they used a grant that we gave them under the Wallace Excellence Awards to um, really explore these, this young professional audience. And what they found was um, a couple of themes. The uh, one is these audiences don't tend to like to commit long in advance. So they wanted shorter, easier, more digestible courses. They wanted it to be a social event. Um, again, that theme that's shown up across multiple uh, bodies of research. And they were really uh, focused on what's the experience. And when the Clay Studio looked at all its marketing materials, what they were marketing was incredibly beautiful ceramic objects, not the act of making uh, the, the, the ceramics themselves. So this is a complicated chart, but it tells a great story, so I'm going to go through it quickly. From 2004 to 2006 is that time before the, this, um, the date night experience and the market research, and you can see that the uh, school revenue was flat in that period. They began doing um, desk research in 2008, which um, developed the insights around need drop-in opportunities and shorter courses, which they began to implement. 2009, some qualitative research on non-attendees, that, that suggested they needed to create unique experiences and get the marketing aligned with this experience over object uh, kind of approach. 
Um, they followed that up with new visitor quality, qualitative research in 2011. And over the course of this period, they took the um, school revenue from the $150,000 level up to the just shy of $400,000. So cumulatively, over the years between 2007 and 2014, this added $894,000 of revenue to the organization for a total, uh, at a total cost over that time period of market research of, of about 300 dollars um, sorry, $375,000. So it's, it's about a two for one return. Um, and, and, and it wasn't $375,000 all at once. It came in increments of like $38,000 and $25,000. So let me stop there and... and